to public lectures. It's so nice to see everyone's faces again. Can you hear me now? Yay. Okay. <laughs> Welcome back to public lectures. We're so excited to see all your faces again. Very exciting. Um, so first and foremost, we want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which all of Swinburne campuses are built on and the Hawthorne area, which is the Wurundjeri people of the East Kulin Nation. And we'd like to pay our respects to the elders, past, present and emerging. Um, and while I chat about housekeeping, you can have a little read and look at the beautiful artwork that was commissioned by us grab up here. It's gorgeous. So. Um, welcome. We are going to be having a, a lecture today from Renhold, which is just so exciting because you're going to be learning about different types of star systems. I feel like we've bored you a lot with like the big questions about why is the universe the shape that it is and why do we have dark matter and dark energy, but now we can get back to some more humbling. Why do stars even do the things they do? Because without stars and interactions of stars, we would not be here and it would be a pretty boring place. So. Some quick facts about Reinhold. He's a PhD candidate at Monash University, final year PhD candidate. So he'll be graduating in November. So everyone can get excited for that. <laughs> yeah, good work. Um, so, and the most exciting thing is he's actually, we squeezed him in this week, thankfully, because he's flying out next week to spend a couple months at Harvard, being all fancy smancy, um, which is gonna be incredible because he's gonna be able to study the hydrodynamic models of interacting stars, which I'm sure we'll learn all more about. Um, but this is something that is super important for trying to understand a heap of different mechanisms in our own galaxy and in how galaxies evolve as well. So very, very cool. In his spare time, he likes to swim, play guitar, go camping and hiking, uh, and anywhere where there's no cell reception, which I feel like we all appreciate that sometimes. So give a warm welcome to Renhold. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, thank you everyone for coming out. Um, seriously, it's great to be back and doing things in person again. Um, I will be speaking today about uh, friendly stars, which is not an official designation, just something I come up with. Um, these are stellar companions, uh, and they're things that are uh, reasonably uncertain. So I'm going to talk a bit about what we know about them and a bit about what we don't know about them. Um, but just before I start, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, uh, OSGRAB, the ARC uh, Center of Excellence for Gravitational Wave Discovery. Um, this is a group of uh, universities in Australia that study gravitational waves, the data analysis of gravitational waves, progenitors, and some of the, uh, the different techniques to measure them. Um, we are uh, fortunate to work with the two LIGO interferometers in the US, um, and the Virga detector in Italy, and the Kagra detector in Japan. Um, and we do a lot of really cool research. If you have questions about Osgrav, I'd be happy to field some of those uh, after the talk. Um, but first, I'd like to start with, what is a friendly star? How can we find friendly stars? And how are they different to regular stars? A friendly star is a star that has a companion or some number of companions, as opposed to a star in isolation, a single star. Um, and the simplest uh, star with a companion is a binary star. A binary star is just two stars that are gravitationally bound in the same region of space. They follow each other on predictable orbits, such as this. These are uh, uh, two uh, ellipses, um, and you can uh, determine the, uh, the size of the ellipses based on the mass of the stars, and they're stable for long periods of time. And this is important, the, the stability of the binary, meaning that we can uh, assume that it will look the same over many, many different cycles of the orbit. Um, and binary stars really came into popular fashion in the 70s, um, when everyone uh, observed a binary star for the first time. Um, the, uh, next, uh, 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 the next advanced uh, uh, version of a stellar companion is a triple star system. And triple stars are straightforward. They are three stars that are gravitationally bound in the same region. Um, they're usually observed in what are known as hierarchies. So hierarchical triples are where you have an inner binary with an outer, they call it a tertiary for the third one. Um, and this is a very uh, stable condition, which is why we, why we observe them in this manner. Um, and if we go uh, a little bit more advanced than that, we can consider uh, star clusters. Star clusters are just many stars that are gravitationally bound together. Um, you can have up to you know, many millions of stars in, uh, in this one region of space. Um, and even though uh, the, the dynamics are very complex and there's a lot of interactions between the stars and many things whipping around each other, um, the uh, individual orbits are chaotic, but the entire cluster is very stable. Um, and there's some famous uh, star clusters that you can see if you have a good telescope. This is the Messier 15 star cluster. Um, the Pleiades, uh, or the Seven Sisters, if you know your constellations, uh, is a star cluster, as are the large and small Magellanic clouds, which you can see uh, only in the Southern Hemisphere. So we're very lucky that we have access to those uh, down here. Um, where I grew up, I actually couldn't see these. Um, but you might be asking yourself, how do we find friendly stars? How do we know what we've seen is a friendly star, a star with companions? Um, and the simplest form of this is uh, in the visible binaries. 
Um, this is straightforward uh, to understand. This is just a star uh, or a star system that we can see by eye or with a telescope that clearly shows two or three distinct uh, components to it. Um, they need to be relatively far apart in order to be resolved. So this first uh, image, you can see this is a, a binary of two brown dwarfs. Um, and at a poor resolution, it comes across looking like one single star. So we don't actually know that it's a binary until we improve our resolution, until we get a better telescope that clearly shows that these two can be split apart. Um, but a, a common issue with, uh, with visible binaries is that it could be a chance alignment. Um, we don't actually know that these two things are in a true binary um, and not just happening to be in the same place on the sky. It could be the case that one is much farther away. Unless we have an estimate to the distance um, or some other way to determine that these two are in fact um, uh, in a gravitational, uh, um, gravitationally bound to each other, it can be very difficult to say. Um, but one of the easiest ways to uh, identify that what looks like a binary is a binary is if we see the entire orbit. Um, and so this can be tricky to do as well, but if we can uh, observe uh, two stars that look like they might be in a binary for a very long time, and you can see, can you, uh, can you see my mouse? Can you, oh, can you not? Yes, kind of. Um, if you can trace out the motion, the relative motion of the two stars over the course of whatever the orbital period is, and you can determine that the orbit, uh, the trajectory of the relative orbit is, a, is an orbit, is an ellipse like this, that's a direct confirmation that what you're looking at must be a binary system. You wouldn't see this if they were uh, very far apart from each other. Um, but again, this is very difficult to do. You need to have uh, good measuring equipment, again, good resolution, um, and a long time baseline. So this particular star, this is a uh, uh, 70 Ophiuchi, has a period of about 90 years. So you need to have good measurements over uh, almost a human life, uh, lifetime time scale in order to, uh, to measure this properly. Um, another way that we can observe uh, binaries in the sky is through eclipsing binaries. And everyone's familiar with a standard solar eclipse. During a solar eclipse, the moon blocks out part of the light of the sun and the brightness dims very briefly. Um, and for eclipsing binaries, it's the same principle. You have uh, one star cover the other star for a period of time. And while it's doing that, the brightness dips. Um, and if you're observing a, a, a true binary system, this will happen periodically. So you occasionally see dipping in stars uh, not due to uh, uh, binary ellipse, but due to some other mechanism. Maybe you have a dust cloud pass in front, or maybe there's a, a, a spot, a stellar spot on the surface, and these things come and go, and they can reduce the brightness in a way that can be confused with something that might be uh, a binary companion, or maybe a planet or something covering part of the star. But if you see the periodicity, if you see a regular dipping of a, of a given magnitude, this is, a uh, again, a direct confirmation that whatever is crossing in front of the star is doing so repeatedly. If you happen to have uh, an eclipsing binary where you see uh, both eclipses, then you can also get an estimate on the, the relative brightness uh, of both. Um, if the, if the uh, brighter star gets eclipsed, then you get a bigger dip in the magnitude than if the less bright star gets eclipsed. So you should see this characteristic deeper dip followed by a less deep dip. Um, and again, the, the, uh, the periodicity here is crucial. That's what tells you that you're in uh, a binary and not, being, um, not observing something else. Um, in order to do this, you need to see the orbit uh, edge on. So if you're looking at a system face on, like we saw previously with the, uh, the visible binaries, the visible binaries are easier to detect if they're face on. If they're edge on, you don't quite see the same uh, difference. But with these, you need to be really right on the edge. If it's, if it's tilted too much, then you're not going to see an eclipse and you can't identify them uh, in that way. Um, but this is really more useful for stars where in this, in this diagram, you can see uh, that the, you can see the two stars um, separately because it's a, a graphic. Um, generally, when we're looking on the sky, we still only see one pinpoint and we're measuring the, the dip in the brightness from that pinpoint over time. Um, but there's a recent paper that, uh, that did this. They looked and they found a, uh, a new eclipsing binary. Um, this is from Lampens et al. 2022. And you can really see how clear it is when you have good observations. You can really see this big dip, um, which is at the, um, the end of the orbital phase here, the beginning and the end. Um, and then this uh, interim uh, dip uh, caused by the, the secondary eclipse. So it really is quite clear when you have good observations that you've seen a, an eclipsing binary. Um, another way that we can tell if we are looking at uh, a binary system is through uh, spectroscopy or uh, to observe uh, spectroscopic binaries. Um, this is uh, due to something uh, that all stars uh, do. They give off spectral lines. Anything that uh, is, can be heated up um, emits uh, 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 across this thermal spectrum um, and so that's this, uh, this rainbow that we see here. If you take uh, sunlight and you split it up in a prism, you get the same uh, uh, beautiful spectrum of lines, uh, sorry, this beautiful rainbow spectrum. Um, but if you look closely, if you have really good resolution, then you can see these lines removed from the spectrum. And these are the spectral lines. And the, the reason they're not there, the reason they've been removed 
is that if there are uh, certain uh, chemical elements in the atmosphere of your star or your sun, um, then uh, as the photons of a given energy pass uh, past those atoms, they're absorbed into the atoms. The atoms have fixed energy bands where they can absorb any photon with that specific energy coming to them. Um, and so as a result, what you see in these spectral lines are regions where for a given atom's specific, frequency, uh, specific frequencies, the frequencies that we associate to those elements, those lines have been removed. Um, and because we can calculate what the, uh, the frequencies are for different elements, seeing these spectral lines tells us what elements are in uh, that particular uh, star. So we can use this to determine what the composition is uh, on a stellar surface. Um, for example, uh, when we looked at the sun for the first time, we saw many lines that we were familiar with um, from doing spectroscopy on Earth. So we knew what carbon lines looked like, we knew what hydrogen lines looked like, um, but we saw a new set of lines that people hadn't seen before. We didn't know what this element was. And so they thought it was an element that was native to the sun and they named it after the Greek name for the sun god, Helios. Um, they had just identified helium for the first time. Uh, it wasn't until a little while later that they discovered that we do actually have helium on Earth, but the first time that we ever found it was, it was from the spectral lines in the sun. Um, and you might be thinking, oh, this is, you know, this is great. We see all these lines here on this, this graphic. Um, you can see the, uh, the different uh, lines that they specify, but this is a sort of a, a very scrunched down simplified version of the spectral lines that you actually see from the sun. Um, the sun uh, has a very, very, uh, when you, when you um, stretch the sun spectrum out and you look for all the individual lines, it's actually, um, there's a lot of detail to it. And you can see that if we were to stretch the spectrum out end to end and then, uh, and then cut it back down and, and overlay it like this, you can see that there are a lot of lines uh, through the whole spectrum and a lot of character to this. And so if you, uh, if you knew your, uh, your elemental transition lines, you could identify from this where the different elements are. Um, and one of the really cool features uh, about spectral lines is that because they're related to uh, the specific frequency of the, uh, the atom itself, so whatever element you have, has, a, has characteristic frequencies um, that are always in the same position. You know what those frequencies are from theory. Um, but if you have, uh, for example, a star that's emitting the certain spectral lines, and it also happens to be moving toward us, you get what's known as Doppler shifting. Um, and some of you might be familiar with, the, uh, familiar with this from, uh, for example, fire trucks. When uh, a fire truck drives towards you, the pitch of the fire truck is fixed um, on the fire truck, but because it's uh, driving towards you, the pitch is raised a little bit. So you hear a higher sound. And when it's driving away from you, you hear a slightly lower sound. Uh, and the same physics applies to, uh, to stars and spectral lines. As a star moving towards you emits with a certain a spectral line with a certain frequency, um, it's, uh, they say, blue shifted to higher frequencies. If it's moving away from you, it moves toward the redder part of the spectrum or it's red shifted. Um, and this allows us to identify how quickly a star is moving toward or away from us. Um, and this is really useful for identifying spectroscopic binaries, because if you have uh, a binary where both, both stars are emitting with a given spectral line, we can see that line in the spectra. If a quarter orbit later, we now see two lines that are split apart, that's because the lines are shifting as the stars move through the orbit. Um, and as the, as the one star is moving toward us and the other star is moving away from us, one line is blue shifted and one line is red shifted. Red shifted. And then at the uh, halfway point of the orbit, they're back to aligned and then another quarter orbit, they're on the other side. And so if we see this, uh, this shifting in the spectral lines, uh, if we see just one spectral line shift back and forth, we know that it's one star that's in a binary that's moving back and forth. Um, if we see um, two spectral lines, we know that it's a double line spectroscopic binary and we can identify that both stars are emitting uh, in that part of the spectrum. Um, and that's a, another great way to um, confirm that we're seeing uh, a binary on the sky. Um, but we might be wondering how these are different to regular stars. Why is this uh, something that we are concerned about? Um, and so just to, to go a little bit over what a single star is, what a regular star is, um, isolated stars, we think we understand somewhat well, fairly well. And some of my friends in the room are going to uh, disagree with me on that one. But we, we understand a bit of the evolution of stars over the course of their lives. And the shortest lived stars live for about 100,000 years, whereas the longest lived stars will live for over 10 billion years. Um, this is much, much longer, of course, than human timescales. We don't really have a good way to understand what 100,000 years looks like, but we can mathematically confirm that these things are, are living for these relatively short periods of time on astronomical scales. Um, and these uh, shortest lived stars, these 100,000 year stars, are the very, very massive ones that are burning fuel in their core at a very, very high rate. Um, when I say they're burning fuel in their core, they're, uh, they're undergoing uh, nuclear reactions in the core to, to fuse lighter elements like uh, hydrogen and helium into heavier elements like carbon or oxygen. 
And you can see here on this, uh, on this diagram of sort of a cutaway of a star, there's my, my cursors there. Um, you can see on this, uh, on this diagram, we have uh, a, a somewhat evolved star that has a hydrogen envelope on the outside with a helium layer. And the base of that helium layer where the pressure and temperature are very high, that helium is burning and fusing into carbon and oxygen, which you have here in the core. So you're building up this core over the life of the star. Um, this, uh, this burning uh, uh, creates heat and pressure that sustains the star. So as it's burning through this fuel, it's able to generate all this energy that then gets radiated off, which is why stars are so hot. Um, uh, the stars uh, at the end of their lives will then have this sort of onion structure to them where they keep building up and burning these layers and building up a successive uh, 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 layering, sort of like an onion, they call it an onion structure, um, to these stars. And you can, uh, you can uh, as you move uh, inward into the star, you get to heavier and heavier, heavier elements until you get to the uh, iron core. And iron is the, uh, uh, the most nuclearly stable element. So if you try and fuse anything heavier than iron, uh, it actually takes energy to do that. Um, so it's not energetically favorable for the star to do this. Um, and so as a result, once you build up this iron core, um, you can't go any further and the star kind of runs out of stuff it can do. It runs out of things that will give it energy back to keep it sustained. Um, and, uh, and so uh, when it does this, it will undergo a supernova explosion. The most massive stars will undergo a supernova explosion. Um, it's a big, beautiful event. Uh, they are often the brightest, uh, uh, they outshine their galaxy for the brief period of time that they're shining. So when we look out on the sky, we might be observing a galaxy and we'll see a bright flash from a galaxy that outshines the galaxy and we know that we've seen a supernova. We can track the light curve and look at the spectra and identify all sorts of things um, related to it. Um, the remnants from uh, supernova explosions are neutron stars and black holes. I won't talk a whole lot about these because it's uh, not the focus of the talk, but they are really, really interesting um, kind of weird uh, astronomical objects. They're the most dense things that we can produce in the universe. So a neutron star is uh, all of, the, all of the, the neutrons in an atom uh, packed together with no space in between them. So often we, when we think about atoms, we think about um, the, the nucleus of the atom is like a bunch of uh, coins at the center of a football pitch, where the football pitch is the whole atom. There's all this space there that's, that's just empty space. And the, the electromagnetic reactions are keeping that, that core, that nucleus, from the neighboring nucleus by a distance of the equivalent of a football field. Um, but in a neutron star, all that space has been squeezed down. So it's like having a collection of coins in one small area. Um, and the density of a neutron star is so high, um, they say that a teaspoon of neutron star matter weighs more than a mountain. So these things are uh, really, really weird to think about. We can't really produce these uh, conditions in a lab on Earth, so it's very hard to study. Um, but it's the densest that any uh, form of matter can take. Um, but if you continue to squeeze this very, very dense form of matter even further past its breaking point, then you squeezed, uh, you squeezed it into uh, sort of an, uh, 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 a finite amount of matter into an infinitely small amount of space, and you get a black hole. So a black hole is the next densest thing after a neutron star, and that's why black holes aren't really considered to be matter. Um, but I've sort of gone a bit of a tangent there. Um, the important thing about this is that as the stars are aging, uh, they're growing a lot. Um, so they're growing in spurts, and at the end of their evolution, they'll have grown to almost a thousand times their original size. Um, and this makes a, a huge difference for uh, anything in the, in the region of the star. So for example, when the sun uh, is at the end of its life, um, it becomes a red supergiant, uh, sorry, a red giant star, um, it will uh, envelop all of the orbits of Mercury, Venus, and even Earth. Um, so you can imagine, you know, as it's, it's already a very large thing compared to what we, what we know on the Earth, um, but it's actually going to envelop the entire orbit and burn up these planets. Um, and so this growth uh, is very crucial to our understanding of stars. Um, but in isolation, it's not really so much of a problem. These stars have room to stretch out. Um, but the interesting thing with the, uh, with the friendly stars, with stars with companions, is that when you have a binary star, you limit the amount of room that it can expand in. So these blue lines here, which are on this graphic, correspond to the largest that a star can grow where the material on the star is still gravitationally bound to that star. If it grows any farther, if it grows beyond those blue imaginary lines, then the material outside those lines is now more attracted to the companion and the companion can accrete that matter. Um, it can extract it off of this star that's expanding, the giant star, and consume that material. Um, uh, and so uh, uh, before this happens, the two stars in the binary behave very similar to single stars. We can treat them as effectively single, um, but as soon as one expands too much, then that material is uh, swept off and, uh, and, and consumed by the companion. And you can strip off the envelopes of the star, the outer layers. 
um, and leave just the bare core behind. Um, and this is really one of the primary differences with binary stars relative to single stars are these uh, moments of interaction. Um, uh, you can see, uh, yeah, you can see here that the, as the star expands, it fills this, uh, this lobe here that's sort of teardrop shape and the material is accreted onto an accretion disk. And I can show you a, a more detailed model of a, uh, uh, an accretion event. This is the same thing. This is a giant star expanding and the material is funneled off into a disk around the, uh, the, the companion star here, where uh, depending on the, uh, the, the type of uh, star that's accreting the material, uh, it might be accreted on, it might be uh, ejected off. Um, it, it, it sort of depends on, on what type of uh, uh, accretor you have. Um, but if the, uh, if the mass transfer is what this is called, if the mass transfer uh, is too strong and the stars are unable to break free again after this, uh, this event, then you have a stellar merger. Um, stellar mergers are very dramatic events where you have a lot of uh, debris and, and a lot of collisions. You'd have um, huge, uh, huge uh, rays of, of energy coming off. Um, uh, and the, the remnant is sort of a, a larger version of the, of the, two, uh, the two stars that made it up. Um, but if we go to one more level of complication, we can consider uh, triple stars. Uh, triple stars are, of course, just uh, with an added uh, perturber. Um, and the, the complication with triple stars is that we no longer have the stable orbits that I mentioned at the beginning for binary stars. Binaries on their orbits are, are more or less predictable. We know how they'll evolve um, just, just from the two, even when they're not uh, interacting, just as they um, go about their orbits, it's very predictable. As soon as you add a third body, you invoke chaos uh, uh, and, and, um, and uh, chaotic dynamics. Um, and so this is uh, the uh, Lorenz Strange Attractor. I'm not gonna go into too much detail about what this is, but the point is that if you start a particle on this object and you let it uh, uh, evolve in the, in the, um, in the system, then it will uh, revolve around uh, that one lobe a little bit and then it'll switch sides and go around the other one. If you happen to start that particle at a slightly different initial condition, at a slightly different location, it might still go around the one and then the other, but you don't know when it's gonna switch. That slight change in the initial conditions means you can no longer predict the long-term evolution. It's gonna have a, a very, uh, uh, it's gonna change the outcome a lot. Um, and so uh, chaos means things are unpredictable and we don't necessarily know how they're going to uh, evolve long-term. Um, this is known as the three-body problem, if that's familiar to any of you. It's a, uh, it's a currently unsolved problem um, because of this chaos, because of the uh, inability to predict the long-term uh, evolution. Um, when we consider the effect of the three-body problem uh, in uh, triple stars, the orbits are no longer uh, uh, clean and, and clear, and um, you get all of these sort of crazy swirls, and it, it, it no longer really looks like an orbit like you'd expect from a binary star. Um, it's really all over the place. Um, and I have a great uh, video I'll try and show. Let me pull this up. There we go. This is uh, what a triple body encounter might look like. This was done for a simulation of black holes. So the idea is that they're so small that you don't have to worry about the actual interaction of any of the, the, the size of the stars, if you know any sort of merger, anything like that. Um, except until uh, they get so close that um, there's no escaping it, but, uh, but you don't have to worry about it for a very long time. But you can see that as the, uh, the binary that came in, it's been perturbed. It's now a very eccentric binary, so it's not really on a circular motion. And then as soon as it gets too close to the third, now it's all disrupted. And this is the part that's very hard to predict. So this is the chaos taking place. And they'll swap around a bit and you'll have an exchange of which ones are in a binary and which ones are, you know, which one's the perturber until two of them get close enough and you get a, a full merger. Um, uh, and so uh, uh, because it's, uh, it's very hard to predict, um, we, we know that these systems are uh, sort of at the forefront of our knowledge. We, we don't know how these things will evolve. We're trying to make predictions about what happens in triple star systems. We're limited by the fact that we don't really know what this long-term evolution will look like. Um, and so the stable binaries are no longer safe. Um, but you might be asking, uh, why is this important? Why are we worried about these things? Um, shouldn't they be rare? And the problem is that we know now that they're not. So this, uh, this graphic here uh, is from a recent paper from 2012. Prior to this, we believed that uh, many of the stars that we observed were single stars, that single stars dominated. And so our, our models of single stars were sufficient to explain galactic dynamics and the universe and, and things that we were trying to understand. Um, but in 2012, uh, this paper showed uh, that uh, of the uh, single and binary stars uh, that, we, that we know of, uh, only about 30%, this wedge that's been removed, 
can be treated like effectively single stars. So this means that they're actually single or they're in non-interacting binaries. Over the course of the whole life of the binary, they won't interact and they're both kind of like single stars. Um, but the rest of the 70% are in things that will interact. So we can no longer ignore uh, these uh, effects of uh, material uh, flowing off of one companion onto the other, of accretion. All of these detailed physics that we, we only kind of understand are now much more important. Um, and so we know that these systems are uh, abundant and we can't ignore them anymore. Um, and then a, a few years after that, this other paper came out that looked at the uh, relative frequency of uh, different kinds of companions to uh, a primary star. Um, and for those that don't look at these plots all the time, I'll just quickly explain. So the primary mass refers to the most massive thing uh, in the system. Uh, the red line refers to the fraction of things uh, of that mass that will have uh, a, uh, that will be single, that'll be isolated. The green line are things that will be binary. So this is the fraction of binaries. The blue line is the fraction of triple systems and the pink line is the fraction of quadruple systems. So four stars in a, uh, in a collection. Um, and uh, what this paper showed was that this fraction is one, uh, it's a function of the mass. So as you change your mass, you're gonna change the likelihood of, uh, of being in a system with uh, different numbers of companions. Um, and then most importantly, they showed that for the lowest masses, so on the left here is the lowest masses, you're more likely to be in a single star. Roughly 60% of your systems are single stars. Roughly 30% are binaries. Uh, in this case, that tells us that our, our assumption that stars are mostly single is not that bad. You know, it's, it's not perfect. The 60% isn't 100%, but it means that we're at least approximately correct. But as you move to higher masses, um, and especially here at the very far right end, you can see that the red line dips quickly and the green line starts to go down quite a bit, which tells us that singles and binaries are no longer the majority. And right here at the very far end, you can see that quadruples and triples take over, which means that the highest mass stars have many, many companions. They're much more likely to be in many companion systems than the lower mass stars. Um, and so this tells us that our assumptions that things are mostly single in this regime are way off. Um, and so we can't ignore them anymore. Um, but we might, uh, we might then wonder, okay, well, what are some of the cool things that um, we can get by studying these interacting stars? And this is some of the stuff that, um, that I study with my group. So I look at interacting binary stars and, and the effects of maybe adding in uh, triple perturber and what that might do to, uh, to these systems. And one of the really cool systems, as I mentioned before, is if you have mass being uh, uh, leaked off of one star and accreted onto the companion, you can get what's known as an X-ray binary. So if the uh, accretor star is a neutron star or black hole, one of these really, really dense objects that, um, that are sort of, you know, everything is just squeezed in much more than, uh, than other stars, then as the material falls into, uh, falls into the gravitational well of these stars, um, the, uh, uh, it's, it's stretched and squeezed and you get these uh, high energy X-rays that are blasted off the, uh, the system. And we can observe these, we observe the X-rays and we know that we've seen a system of an accreting black hole or neutron star. And in this graphic, the jets that are coming off of this uh, accretion disk are the, uh, the X-rays and the X-ray binary. Um, we can also look at uh, merging stars. Um, and this here is, uh, uh, this is actually a photograph. This is not a, uh, a graphic of uh, a star known as uh, Eta Carina. This is a very weird system. It's got these uh, really cool kind of snowman kind of clouds coming off of it. They call these the humunculus clouds. Um, this is thought to be a, uh, uh, a merger of a binary that was induced to merge by a, uh, a triple star previously um, before it underwent a supernova explosion. So the actual star in the system is right there in the middle. Um, it's, it's kind of in that bright spot in the middle and this uh, cloud around it is coming from the supernova that um, would have probably preferred to eject in a sphere, but was, uh, was gripped kind of around the middle by a sort of a, a denser, almost a belt around the, uh, the merged star. Um, again, this is all, you know, it's just, uh, in some sense, it's speculation. We, we can't really prove these things, um, but this is a, a sort of a recent result um, that, uh, that comes from looking at what happens when you have these uh, interacting binaries and triples. Um, you can also have uh, stripped envelope supernovae. This is something that's very uh, near and dear to me. Um, as I said before, if you have uh, an interacting binary where you have uh, a star that has its outer layers stripped off and you're left with just the core of the star, um, then you no longer have the same chemical elements in the atmosphere. So if you were to look at the spectrum of a star that's been stripped, you might not see the hydrogen lines that you would expect in a normal star. Um, and if this star then undergoes its own supernova explosion, we don't see those hydrogen lines in the supernova explosion. We call this a stripped envelope supernova. We know it's been stripped. Um, and this is again a, a photograph of uh, Cassiopeia A or Cas A. Um, this is a type 2b supernova remnant. Um, this just means that it was mostly stripped but not completely stripped. 
Um, and so uh, we, we can infer from this that it must have had some evolutionary trajectory that got that that stripped off its envelope and we can speculate about what that might have been what kind of binary that might have been how it ended up with this particular uh, uh fraction of hydrogen to helium um in its uh, uh in its uh, supernova remnant um and we can also look at um uh, uh, uh what are known as uh, binary black hole or binary neutron star mergers um, and this is a really exciting uh, area of astrophysics that um uh, many of us at osgrav and many of my colleagues are are actively pursuing um, this is uh, when you have two black holes or two neutron stars that manage to survive to the point where they can be in a tight binary together. And this is not straightforward. We don't, we don't really necessarily know exactly how this happens. But when you get to the point where they are in a very tight binary together, as they spiral in toward each other, they emit what are known as gravitational waves. Um, and this is one of the last, uh, the, the, the most recently proven uh, aspects of Einstein's theory of general relativity was that you, you actually have these gravitational waves, which comes from uh, two objects that are very dense and nearby each other. Um, they stretch and squeeze space in a way that extracts energy from the system. It allows the two objects to get in closer and closer together, and you get these ripples in space time, which uh, look kind of like this, something like this. It's kind of hard to say what they would look like. But as it stretches and squeezes space, you end up uh, with um, it becomes uh, possible to detect uh, what is a very minute stretching and squeezing on Earth. So, um, so the detectors themselves uh, use uh, laser beams that measure the distance between different, uh, uh, different um, uh, they measure distances in different directions. And if you were to detect a gravitational wave, you would detect it by finding the stretching in one direction is different to the squeezing in another direction. Um, and this is a confirmation that you've, you've measured a merger of two compact objects very, very far away. Um, and this is, uh, as I mentioned, a very active, exciting area of astrophysics. Um, but we uh, have many questions. Um, and so we're always confused and always trying to learn more. Um, but uh, I'm curious if any of you have any questions um, uh, for me or for any of my colleagues. Uh, yeah. Uh, the, uh, binary the binary transients? Yeah, yeah. Uh, they would they would look very similar. So we actually use that same method to find exoplanets. The difference will be in the depth of the uh, the curve. So a an exoplanet, um, even if it's a very large exoplanet around a very dim star, is still going to cover only a very small fraction of the star. Um, and so you won't see. You need a very good um, uh, very good telescope to see the very subtle amount of dipping, but you, you get the exact, yeah, it's the same principle. You're saying it showed about how much? This one here, yeah? Oh, the, this one, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, about, yeah. Uh, I, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, do you happen to know? Yeah. So it would depend on, the, again, on the planet. Um, a lot of them, you know, you, you, for that particular type of observation to detect an exoplanet in that way, you need a really, really big planet very close to the star and a, uh, a relatively dim star. But yeah, something like, you know, less than 1% would be. It does. It you can you can uh, estimate the time scale. So if you know uh, if you know how long it takes for the star to uh, to dip and come back, you can determine how long the if you do the geometry correctly, you can figure out uh, how what the separation is. So if it's um, for a planet of a given mass uh, at a given separation, you know the orbital period as it's going around the star. Um, and if you know the size of the star that you're looking at, you can figure out what fraction of the orbital period you are dimming for and you can figure out um, the you can you can play it in reverse you can use the fact that you know how long it was dimming for to figure out the orbital characteristics um, yeah yeah
it's it's that's a great question. Uh, my understanding, and I'm not a, I'm not an expert in this field, but my understanding is that the gravitational wave itself is is a stretching and squeezing of if you if you want to think about it the the medium of space, and that's not really technically the 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 best way to describe it, but if it helps, you think about kind of like the fabric of space time being stretched and squeezed, kind of like in the graphic that I showed. And uh, if you were if you were to imagine you know ripples on on a pond, as you have uh, ripples, if you were to go really close to it, the rippling would go up in one direction and down in another, and that allows you to, for at least for the laser beams, to uh, uh, in a sense travel a, a shorter distance or a longer distance, and that's what the detectors are measuring: is that is that relative change in distance that the two that the photons are are uh, traveling on in between um, the detectors. I don't know if that made sense. Yeah? This is probably a really dumb question, but so how sun is a single planet? Yeah. So we're not interested in knowing about the dwarf. They had a theory a few years ago that there might be a brown dwarf on the other side of it. That was something that they were actively uh, on, the side, uh, on the other side. On the other side. So if, we, if we're on this side and it's on that side, we would never see it. They thought it might, there might be some you know, cause for some some warbling or something, but uh, yeah, no, they've, they've disproven that one. Yeah. Uh, sorry, what was your question? Oh, was it the question? Was it? Was it? A, a oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, interestingly, I, I meant to bring this up uh, earlier, but the um, the the triple star. Um, where did it go? Yeah. Um, this is uh, um, uh, Alpha Centauri. So this is the uh, our nearest neighbor star, Alpha Centauri. Um, is actually composed of a triple system. Um, so this is Alpha A, Alpha B, and the very dim Alpha Centauri C um, also goes by the name Proxima Centauri um, because it's, uh, it is truly the closest star to us. It's about, uh, from memory, I think it's about a parsec away, um, which just means it's a very long way, about, about, about four light years. Um, but, uh, but this is sort of uh, recently, so for a long time, this was known as a triple system very close to us where uh, A and B are, themselves in a binary and C is uh, the outer tertiary. Um, but uh, more recently, it's been proposed that this is actually a chance alignment um, where uh, Alpha Centauri C or Proxima Centauri is just on a flyby um, and is not actually gravitationally bound. So this is always, we're always learning new things. We're always updating our, our understanding of this, um, but it's, it's looking like that might be a uh, less tentative result um, and it might not actually be a, a triple system. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I should have explained that clear. Um, so uh, when we think of when we think of binaries, at least from the theory side, we think of the whole lifetime of the binary. And so uh, the the question is, you know, if we if we start a binary like this, like just you know, in, with whatever initial conditions that we start with, and we let it evolve according to our best assumptions about how these things will expand, what kind of materials they'll fuse, how how much they'll grow. Will they expand and, and surpass that blue dashed line that I showed earlier? Is it going to get that big? If so, uh, then you transfer that material and it becomes an interacting binary. But if both of them can expand in their entirety and not, not fill that, that blue line, um, then, uh, then we refer to that as a non-interactive binary. Um, from, an observe, from an observation standpoint, uh, an observer might take a more strict definition of it as to specifically binaries that are right now interacting or not. Um, so if you look on the sky and you see two stars that are distinct, you might say that's a non-interactive binary. Even though a theorist might say, well, in about you know, 10 million years, it will interact, so that's an interactive binary. Um, but yeah, subtle differences. Yeah? Could, could they draw the uh, X-ray things? It's always a binary which can be achieved. Is mm -hmm. that actually uh, something in the system that causes that, or is that an easy way to represent? My understanding is that you, when you get jets, they are typically at right angles to the accretion disk. Um, when, when jets are involved, I'm not sure if the jets in that diagram accurately reflect X-ray binaries. My understanding is that X-ray binaries are much more, um, much more spherical in their X-ray ejecta. Um, I may be wrong about that, but I think it's, I, I think it's the case that if, it, if a binary is an X-ray binary, if it's uh, producing X-rays, that we can see it at any orientation. It's not necessarily orientation dependent. But yeah, I, that's that's not necessarily my my easy either. How far apart uh, are the story A and B? And which which way do they go? Take a roundabout. 
You know, I looked this up when I was doing the research for the uh, the presentation, and I uh, I can't remember um, off the top of my head. I, I don't know the uh, <laughs> I, I don't know the uh, the rotation period. I think that they are. I I think it might be. Oh no, you know what it is? It's uh it's the distance to Uranus. It's something like eight uh, astronomical units. They're really really close. So um yeah so uh, each of the planets is roughly twice the distance of the previous planet. It kind of doubles each time. So uh, that I think it's something like. So eight astronomical units is eight times the distance of the Earth to the sun. And I think that's the distance of these two stars. So they're very, very close. On, on this picture? No. Uh, they, they do spin around each other. I'm not, I'm not sure uh, um, what this time scale for that would be. I think that they are slightly less massive than the sun, but I, I don't know for sure. But yeah, they'd be, they'd be in an orbit moving all the time. And then the... Alpha Centauri C would be on a, it would look like a slow trajectory around it, kind of like a, like a distant planet around the sun. And that's why it's very difficult to say if it's actually gravitationally bound or just happens to be flying very nearby. Yeah. Uh, the nearest galaxy is the Andromeda galaxy. Is that what you're thinking of? Yeah. Yeah, Alpha Centauri is um, uh, our star, watch up star. Um, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. Um, uh, with supernova 1As, you have a, uh, a white dwarf star. So this is the stellar, it's a, it's like a, uh, the core of a star after it's, uh, blown off its, its, uh, outer layers of winds. Um, they are the, the end point of stellar evolution when your star is too low mass to supernova. So if you have a supernova, you end up with a neutron star black hole. Uh, if you don't, you end up with a white dwarf. Um, and so uh, if, you, if you have a white dwarf just sitting there, um, but it happens to have a companion that it can accrete from, it's the same principle as the, the accretion for the other systems. Um, if it accretes so much matter over the course of whatever period of time it's accreting, um, that it, it surpasses its own uh, ability to, to, um, to keep itself stable. Um, similar to what I said before about the neutron star, if you continue accreting material on a neutron star and squeezing it, it'll squeeze into a black hole. If you do the same thing to a white dwarf and you create so much material that it can't hold itself up, it will collapse into a neutron star, we think, um, or uh, produce a type 1a supernova. Um, but it's, as, there's a lot of uncertainty about uh, if you can actually get a neutron star from the collapse of the white dwarf. Um, type 1a is generally are very hard to, to, um, to, uh, to, to study. It's, um, it's something that's a very active and interesting area of research. Um, but, we, we do think that you, you get these collapses because you, one of the nice things about type 1a is, is that uh, because it's, it happens at this um, predictable mass for the white dwarf, if the white dwarf gets to a specific value for the mass, it will collapse and produce a, uh, a supernova with a, um, a, a roughly constant luminosity. And we think we know that luminosity really well, which means that if we see a type 1a supernova very far away and we see how bright we see it from here, we can use the fact that we know how bright it is intrinsically to determine the distance. So they're really good at, uh, we, we, call, we call them uh, standard candles. We can, we can use them to figure out distances to things really well. Um, but I'm not sure about the 99% the uh, filling thing. That's news to me. Yeah? <laughs> you got me there. Uh, he knows that I've been asking a lot about this recently. Um, it's uh, that's a great a great open question. So uh, so stars generally form from uh, uh, from big gas clouds, and we know that they start as big big gas clouds that uh, fragment, um, and then uh, sort of over the course of uh, of you know many thousands of years, they squeeze down into what we know of as stars that can begin this fusion process. Um, but there's a big big open challenge that uh, is yeah, still yet to be resolved, where the distance that is required to fill the gas cloud after it's fragmented to squeeze down into a star, that distance is much greater than the distance of the stars that we see even in the young, young binaries. We don't know how that, we don't know how to resolve that. We don't know how to get stars close after they're born very far apart. 
Is that a good question? Cool. Yeah? Yeah, mine was just about similar to what we played before about the accretion of this going onto a, onto a white floor. Um, I think when it gets up to a certain limit, as you said, I think it's like 1.4 solars max mm -hmm. or something that's the same compound. It, it goes into a, a, a supernova. But when it's actually got multiple, whether it's three or four binaries interacting, does that change the limit that it goes into a carbonized supernova? The, uh, the, the mass limit is, is uh, pretty well understood. That comes from the, the physics of how the white dwarf can sustain itself. So if you, can, if you take a white dwarf and you get its mass above 1.4, it will collapse. If you happen to have two white dwarfs that uh, merge together and the mass is greater than 1.4, it will collapse, but it will collapse with a mass greater than that 1.4 because it, it was the sum total of both of them. Um, so that might be a bit trickier to, um, to comment on, but. Um, at least if you just have a, a single white dwarf for creating, then it has this really nice mass cutoff that we can predict um, fairly well from theory. We, we see lots of gas clouds that are star forming. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the, uh, uh, the pillars of creation. It's this really beautiful uh, Hubble image of these kind of giant, uh, many light year tall columns. And we know that those are forming stars. We see stars being born in those clouds, um, obviously over very, very long time scales. Um, but uh, we don't see, I want to be cautious as I say this, I think we don't see any uh, binaries being formed in a way that explains how they got there from the, the large gas clouds. But we do see um, young stellar associations of very massive stars um, in, these, uh, in these configurations that have many stars kind of coupled together. And they, we know that they must have formed in this way somehow. They're so young that they, you know, it, it, there must be something in the formation process that drives them together, but we don't understand that. We don't know where that comes from. Oh uh, yeah. So it's a bit of just from Star Wars as well. Do these binary systems have collapse? You know, they don't survive in space at all. Uh, that that is a great question. Um, there there are people studying this. It's uh, it's another uh, very open uh, active field. Um, I believe the answer is we think they can. Um, and the reason is that even though uh, so triples generally are an unsolved problem. The the chaos makes it very tricky to sustain um, any kind of stable orbits. But if you have two stars and a planet. The planet's not really doing much to drive that instability. I mean, you still basically have a binary with some, you know, effectively a particle of dust way out here. It's not not going to change the the orbit much. So you can at least have a somewhat stable orbit of the planet around the binary stars. Whether you can have a uh, you know uh, any sort of uh, any sort of conditions that could sustain life, if that's your question, uh, that's that's a bigger question because you're not at the same distance from the stars. So your Goldilocks zone of, of you know, temperature being roughly constant and, and suitable uh, is, um, uh, it's, it's not quite there. Your temperature fluctuates quite a bit. That's my understanding. Yeah? Um, of the triples that we have seen, are there any, that, any configurations that are actually stable or that they're always just kind of the chaos? Yeah, that's, that's the, um, the, the ones that we see. So this is the, uh, the Alpha Centauri ones. Um, I, I'll bring this up again. This is why the ones that we see are usually in these hierarchical triples. So uh, this is the, the sort of the, the, the most obvious stable configuration of a triple when you have an inner binary and then a tertiary that's so far away, it's still gravitationally bound, but it can view the inner binary as sort of just a bigger single star. Um, so it's sort of like a binary and kind of a second binary if you want to think about it that way. Um, the reason that we see it this way is that if they're unstable, they don't last very long. So the, the things that we see in space are the things that can last that way a really long time. We don't really see much that's, um, that's changing quickly unless it's uh, very bright. So like a supernova explosion is a very short-lived thing, but they're so bright and they, we can see them so far away that we catch a lot of those if we know, if we know how, um, how to look for them. Um, another, another great question. Uh, this goes back to the, um, uh, the uncertainty and how these things form in the first place. Um, probably if we're seeing an isolated triple, it was 
it was probably born that way. Somehow it was it was condensed into being a triple, you know, in that in that configuration. But they were probably all born around the same place. Um, but if you see a triple in a globular cluster or any kind of star cluster like this, the dynamics are so intense. Everything is swapping around and moving so much that you can periodically get triples and often they are uh, unstable triples that are just kind of short lived, but you can form a triple very easily in a cluster um, before one of them, you know, flies off and then joins another triple somewhere else. I suppose eventually, um, my, I don't think that they are so close to each other that there's a lot of uh, really intense dynamics there, the way that you see in, um, in a star cluster like this. Um, but I think probably on a long time scale, you wouldn't expect them to all be um, situated where they are. Uh, absolutely, yeah. So uh, if we if we happen to see uh, a triple that's moving around chaotically, it's it's short lived, but they we know that they do uh, they do occur, they do happen. So it becomes a question of the uh, the probability of us viewing this thing, which which boils down to a question of how long does this event happen relative to the lives of the stars. So if you imagine, you know, let's say hypothetically that it, you had a single star that lived for a um, hundred million years and for uh, 100,000 of those years, it was in a chaotic triple. And that's probably the wrong number to use, but let's just say it was in that chaotic triple for 100,000 years. Then it spends 0.1% of its life in that situation, which means that if we observe 1,000 stars that are all that all have that same probability of being in a triple, then uh, we should see one that's in that situation. Um, I, I'm not an expert in, in three body dynamics. Um, I might pass on to one of my colleagues in a moment, but uh, my understanding is that the, the higher code triple is the way to get a stable triple system. Um, but I might, I might pass it on to Rio, do you know? An equilateral triangle all moving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard to form that. You can maybe do it in theory, but yeah, thank you. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You, you form it. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you, you do see a lot, a lot more uh, groupings and, and systems formed here. Um, the dynamics allow you to, uh, you, can, you can even start with two separate stars, two single stars that are flying by each other and one gets caught into the orbit around the other one. Um, if you have uh, tides and things with a lot of fluid dynamics, you can, you can capture a star. Um, and if you, have, um, if you have two stars in a binary, they can capture a third and even eject usually the lightest of the three back out. So you get a lot of these exchanges, um, similar to the, um, the dynamics we saw in the video before. Um, you, you see a lot of these, yeah, a lot of interplay. Sorry? I, I specialize in the interacting binaries. So things like the, uh, the stripped envelope supernovae, I'm doing a project on those right now. I'm trying to look at, can we, uh, can we make predictions about the rates of stripped to unstripped supernovae? Do we, do we know enough about binary evolution and stripping and how these stars form and things like that um, to be able to uh, compare to observations and, and, and do inference and then do it in reverse and say, okay, we, we know this what the observations are telling us. What can we learn about our models and where the models fail? based on the comparison of the observations. Yeah.
Uh, it it does, yes. Yeah. So the um, the the globular cluster on a on a star scale is changing a lot. Things are whipping all around. There's a lot of motion, um, but on a star cluster scale, things are on average very constant. I mean, you see you see a similar kind of principle when you think about um, uh, like a like a bucket of water or something like that, a pot of water. Um, if you let it boil on a stove, each of those water particles is moving a lot. The motion is very chaotic. It's all over the place. But if you step back and you look at the, the pot kind of from a distance, it's, it's sort of, you know, it's not static because it's boiling, but it's, it's on average a, a more constant thing than the individual particle motions. So the cluster is kind of stable, even though the internal parts of the cluster are not. Does that make sense? It does, yeah. So you have um, you you have a lot of gravity, a lot of objects that are uh, squeezing things down to the center. But as you increase the amount of things in the center, and you increase the amount of interactions between things, you can speed up a lot of the components. And the speed allows you the additional speed is a form of um, energy which works sort of to to keep the the cluster from collapsing. Um, it's sort of like with the stars as you squeeze them. And you heat things up in the center, you allow it to um, to uh, to keep itself from completely collapsing. Um, but you do get um, you do see with globular clusters, you see a, a sort of a somewhat clearly defined core where there's definitely more stars. And one of the uh, one of the ways that they determine the age of a cluster is if the core has been uh, if the core has collapsed. Um, so at some point, there's enough pressure that it does squeeze in on itself, and then all the stars sort of expand out, and you you lose that sense of a clearly defined core. Um, but this is over the course of, you know. I'm sorry? Uh, probably to some extent. I think that the, the radiation from the stars is not the, the dominant form of energy loss. Um, I think that it's it comes from, you get things like, um, you know, because there's so many dynamics, you do get uh, stars and binaries and things being uh, ejected out of the clusters. Um, and so as you as you just let a cluster sit, it is slowly losing particles and there's not really a, a stable, there's not, a, uh, there's not a way to have a cluster that's infinitely stable. It can be stable on a very long time scale, but eventually all clusters will kind of self disrupt. Yeah. That's a good question. Uh, I, have, I have no idea. <laughs> I, don't, I don't do enough with the dark matter. You stumped me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's um, a paper that some of my, my colleagues are working on right now um, is what happens when you have this mass ratio reversal. So if the two stars are somewhat kind of close in mass and the first one uh, evolves a little bit faster and starts to expand, but they happen to be so close that it transfers that material onto the, the companion. And then that one becomes bigger and it starts evolving faster. You can go back and forth, you can slosh. Um, if it's not quite so equal mass, you can still have the mass ratio reversal and you can have um, a, the, the more evolved star is the smaller star, which is counterintuitive. Um, the most famous example of this is the star system uh, Algol, um, which is the 